Shalom, this is Avram Shira. We're here in Har Miron, making the ascent on foot. Uh, they're not allowing cars in, as usual, understandably. I'm sure there's all kinds of investigations going on. So I thought I would uh, just invite you to join me. This is kind of an awesome thing to go back to a place like this where such tragedy occurred. And the Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of God's name that was done here was by virtue of the fact that it's beyond our intellect. And the souls that were taken from us were pure souls. If you look at their faces as they were published today, you don't see the faces of people that go against God or His laws or His customs as passed down through all the centuries of Jewish practice. You see the pure souls that completed what they needed to do in this world and we're going to continue the ascent here and hopefully we'll do a little learning from the Zohar about this tragic event because we understand that the Zohar is not just a book of practices and ideas and teachings from the mystic masters of the past. The Zohar is another tool that God gave over to mankind to discern His will, to discern the future. And like any code, it's not all revealed to us, but rather there are patterns that we must decipher, that we must find and respect and discover to enter into the intention of the one who wrote the code. Now, if anybody has ever written a code, you know that you're writing it for somebody specific. And if there are people that you don't want to know your code, you'll write it in such a way that it will be rejected by them. I think you'll find that throughout the Torah, especially in the Torah of the Kabbalah. There, there are codes there for people who want to know, who pe for people who are sincere about not only knowing the will of God, but doing the will of God. And there are, of course, people that don't like this idea. They think that God is just an open book. Well, <laughs> God is an open book, but He's got thousands and thousands of pages. And you're going to have to spend a lot of time just to get to know how much we don't know, including the reason why tragedies and massacres like this happen. So we're going to continue the ascent here, and we'll hopefully merit to learn some of Rabbi Shimon's prophecies as they were encoded in the Zohar. And why does God encode prophecies in the Zohar? Well, because He wants us to know that nothing is by coincidence, that nothing is happenstance, that nothing is left to chance when the world is being run by a perfect Creator. He wants us to know those things, and He wants us to discover them, to have the excitement, the thrill of the discovery that it really is true. There really was a Moses and an Abraham, and these people really experienced the continuous guiding hand of God that led the world to where it is in a spiritually holy sense with all the potential of all the greatness and the goodness of the redemption that we're waiting for. But just like there are holy forces, there are unholy forces, and the Torah teaches us how to deal with those as well. I hope you all have 
having a good weekend and uh, I've been able to process some of the pain, process some of the trauma that's happened here because when we process it, we heal and we grow and we become more whole. All the best to all of you. Hi, how you doing? Wanishma. All the best. Here on the path, rising up to the Tzion of Rabbi Shimon, you see a uh, little spray paint, little graffiti, Tain Chiyuch. Give us a smile. So that seems to be a very hard command right now. But we're going to try to find the balance between joy and sadness, between mourning and celebration, between acceptance and disbelief. See, the roads are pretty empty. Got a pictures around. And this is a road we've walked many times before. And it's a road that, of course, is paved recently, but there are many reports of tzaddikim that would crawl on their hands and knees up this hill to get to Rebbe Shimon's grave in their awe of the holiness. And, you know, for someone who's never experienced that kind of awe, it would make you crawl on your hands and knees. It sounds absurd. It sounds exaggerated. It could even be sound fanatical. But the truth is that we don't know. And we have to accept we don't have the understanding to receive the understanding. So that's a challenge to all of us spiritually. We don't like to admit we don't know things. But the beauty is that if we just admit and understand that we don't understand, we make a vessel to receive some of that understanding of the sensitivity that mystical lifestyle leads to, the sensitivity to receive things far beyond this world. You sense here an aftermath of something, something that obviously everybody deals with in their own way. But you see that people are coming all afternoon. They're not letting cars in, so people have to walk up the hill or drive around the side of the mountain. But it's hard to imagine 100,000 people in this location. And it's kind of hard to imagine trying to be the one who's organizing such an event, how to manage the flow of people, which seems to be at the center of the problem. So, it's something to contemplate when we understand the unbelievable responsibility that the government has towards the citizens that come here. And here you see the main entrance everybody comes through usually again a very narrow space <coughs> for hundreds of thousands of people these words on top that translates as the holy angel from heaven came down and that he told the elders of Yavne when he was 22 years old they said the Torah will be forgotten Reb Shimon Bar Yochai, the young man, stood up in front of all of them and said, Lo mi pizaro, that the Torah would not be forgotten from the Jewish people. And you see that he prophesied then, and it's still true today. This is the place where the people fell. And just down below there, to your left of the screen, they were not allowed to get out. And this is actually one of the police uh, headquarters on the whole mountain. And on this metal floor, everybody was slipping. So they were gotten, getting trampled here, all the, all the way up. And on top of, the mount, of this ramp, you'll see that the other outlets to get off this plane of this, the whole mountain we're also closed. There's a lot of people around. People that were here, they're explaining what happened. 
Thank God I wasn't here. I didn't see it. People saw things that they will never forget. People saw things that they should not have to see. But I guess, you know, I'm not running the world. Up there, the Betoldos are in Hasidim. And they would have an app access over there under that tarpaulin you see above. There's a tunnel and an access, a exit. And, but that was also closed and not allowed people to get out properly. And so, you see there were problems throughout the management of this event. But this is an event that needs a stadium that would hold 200,000 people. This is a stadium that holds about 10,000 people on a good day. So you see there's a miscalculation of of human uh, management, of managing such events. And if anybody begins with conspiratorial talk, they should really do a little research first, and maybe a lot more than a little research before they start blaming people. Uh, there are people that are taking responsibility, but you can see here, this is a small area. It's uh, 15 meters over to those bleachers and this is no place for 50,000 people to be cramming in trying to get out of. Here's another view of the bleachers where all the people were standing that night. The beautiful mountains in the background. And you can see here how small the space is. There's so many people to be passing and over there where that blue floor is was the well the place we don't want to give it a name that's where everybody slipped started falling on each other and the chaos became tragedy there was no structural fall of anything I heard rumors of all kinds of things that people said happened but apparently it was just the slipping and Jews falling on Jews and getting crushed and then people not being allowed to get out. So there's a complicity of issues going on here. But you can see all of this really is not a space for 100,000 people, much less two or three or however many. But we're not here to blame. We're here to try to ease reality. And I'm hoping that by seeing some of these places, it's, it's more real in our mind and not a fantastic imagination of some of the things that we can think. And when we see things, it takes a picture in the mind that settles the mind into some hold of reality. When it's purely imaginary, it can cause much greater suffering because the not knowing leaves the mind without a hold, a place, something that can actually ease our sense of chaos and disorder. And so what will be done? Well, we'll see what will be done. But I think, if nothing else, it should give us a greater sense of the value of life and the value of carefulness and planning and good thinking and sober consideration of all the elements before such events happen again, God forbid. But next year, Lagbomer will come. And I have a feeling it will be different next year, I hope. <laughs>